Hi, everyone. Today we have Dr. Lucy here, who's been with us a few times before um, from Real Life Medicine. Hi, Dr. Lucy. How are you going? Good, darling. How are you? Yep, we're really good. I love your necklace. You look you're all jazzed mm-hmm. up you're wearing our trackies. <laughs> Well, as you know, I was telling you just before, I had literally run in, whipped off my scrubs, and I thought, oh, I might dress up for you girls. So I found a t-shirt on the floor and a necklace hanging on the doorknob, and I thought, oh, that'll do, that'll do. But I'm actually pretty happy. I'm going to I'm gonna boast a bit about my lockdown hair because I haven't been to the hair. Oh, you're just rubbing it in. Wow. Yeah, no, you're sorry. Talk about rub it in. Look at mine. It's just horrible. Good. Yeah, I've been in my chair in her life and I'm like, yeah. I've got like Cruella de Vil, you know, grey things coming out. I'm like, I'm just going to go with it now. I'm growing it out. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. That's a very Lady Die. You think Lady Die <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, I, I've talked about my hair in some form of video. Because every time you always weeks. see it on the video and you're like, oh, God, this is bad. <laughs> well, I soon. think it's we get a cut soon. Yeah. <laughs> so we are going to talk all things cholesterol today. It's always a hot topic. People mm-hmm. always want to know about cholesterol. Um, so where do we start, Dr. Lucy? What is cholesterol? Why do we need it? Okay. So first thing to know is cholesterol is not some demonic plague. We all have to have cholesterol. It is the it, it is crucial to the formation of our cells. Every single cell wall has cholesterol in it. It is also the um, kind of ingredients, if you like, for our sex hormones, so estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, the vital ingredient for that, cholesterol. So it's not it's not terrible we have to have some and the goal isn't to drive it as low as possible right because sometimes that tends to be the focus because people don't want it to be high Mm. yeah yeah and the tricky thing is that so cholesterol is is this waxy sort of product and then people sort of try and divide it into this concept of good cholesterol and bad cholesterol but at the end of the day cholesterol is just cholesterol that's like water there's water and water it is the same structure but what happens is it gets wrapped up in this little proteiny kind of contraption called a lipoprotein so people hear about high density lipoproteins or hdl and low density lipoprotein or ldl and they're the two products that get awarded the gold star hdl the good cholesterol and ldl is again plunged into you know demon land and being told it's the bad cholesterol Mm -hmm. so you may have guessed that i don't subscribe to the good and bad the virtue signaling of cholesterol isn't (laughs) um isn't isn't really you know the way that we look at it so um one of the really important things is to understand that LDL is again not there's there's actually seven types of LDL and when you have a standard blood test at the doctor's it doesn't tell you that it just gives you the whole lump all the LDLs locked in together and within that LDL framework there's actually helpful LDL and unhelpful or if you want to be you know keeping it simple you can call it good LDL and bad LDL Um, and so without doing a more thorough test you don't actually know which one you've got so it's really that that's something that I didn't know when I was you know I mean I'm still a GP but I didn't know that like five years ago I was still back into the HDL LDL good bad business so that's sort of I guess the number one point is that if your LDL is high then you really probably want to know what sort of LDL you have Now, we have a few clues, which is what everyone talks about when they want to know about your triglyceride to HDL ratio. So for those who are into the science of it all, if your triglyceride is low, you are likely to have the good LDL, but it's not a guarantee. So, in fact, I just saw a lady today, and if you looked at her profile, you would be absolutely sure she would have the good LDL because her triglycerides are super low, like 
0.5. Her insulin's low. She's all low carb, that's why she comes to see me. But when we did her LDL profile, her subfractions, they weren't that good. So that's not anything she's, she's not doing anything wrong. It's just her genetics. So there are certainly some genetic components to it as well. Mm -hmm. And is there anything you can do about that? Like if you did get that test and found out you, you didn't have the good ones, and I guess in that lady's circumstance, all her other things seem right. Yes. Is there anything that you can do about it or is that main medication? All right, so what we're doing with her was that we did um, something called a calcium artery score, so a coronary mm -hmm. artery calcium score or a CAC, um, because that gives us the, her baseline level of plaque in her arteries because the whole idea right of course everyone's worried about cholesterol because we think it's going to clog your arteries we're all worried about cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease as we should be we definitely should be worried about cardiovascular disease it's still the number one killer so mm -hmm. we, we need to be onto it but this idea that you know if you have a high number of uh, in your cholesterol that it's clogging your arteries like fat down a drain that's that's not that's not a good visual it's not actually accurate so with her, we did a CAC score to see what her underlying baseline um, calcium is, and it was very low. It was just, it was one. I would have loved it to be zero, but it was one. But anyway, that's still extremely low. So got plenty of time is what that gives us, plenty of time to decide what to do. So what we decided to do was that she was going to change her diet a little bit to see if adding in some extra fish would be helpful to see if adding in some, she doesn't take a supplement of uh, vitamin K2 so or vitamin D. So we decided we'll supplement with those two and then we'll repeat the subfraction in six months. Yeah. So And then if it's still, if she's still got the small dents, then we have to make a decision. And, you know, the, and the decision then is do we just keep watching it or do we put in a statin? And that'll be a discussion, obviously, between her and I. Yeah, right, I guess. So what did, would you say to someone who's been to their GP, they've had their blood work done and they've been told by their GP that their total cholesterol is high and they need to go on a statin or they need to look at lowering that? Yeah. Obviously you need to look at that much further, but quite often that is what's happening. Mm. People are going to their GP, having a mm. blood work and being told their total cholesterol is too high and they need to work on getting it down. Yeah, absolutely. And particularly if you're a low carber, that, that is, it, you are likely to have a higher cholesterol than you, well, actually that's, that's okay. not entirely true. Yeah. Some people, if they're low carb, will get a higher cholesterol than they did before they went low carb, which is kind of, people go, oh, it's because you're eating all the fat, it's because you're eating all this dairy. And that that's actually not true either. It can be both. We may be ingesting a little bit more cholesterol in eggs, butter and milk, well, cream, whatever. But our liver can also make a bit more. And that's all to do with the way you oxidize your fat. That's all done in the liver and cholesterol is made in the liver and they share a pathway. So quite often the production of ketones for some people share a common pathway with the production of cholesterol. So you end up having a, an increase in both. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, is that a big deal? That's the question. Is it a big deal? And you really have to look at a person in their entirety. So I'd like to know what are the other risk factors. Again, if you're smoking, that that's worry about that. Worry about that, number one, before deciding that you're too worried about having a statin because smoking is the number one, two, three, and four cause of heart disease. It buggers up our... Um, the, the kind of protective lining within our arteries. We have this little fine little hairy thing called a glycocalyx and it's it protects our arteries and smoking buggers it up, ruins it, makes holes in it and allows for all sorts of things to go in. So I always say to him, first of all, stop smoking, get help. There's lots of help out there. I, I, and I, I don't I'm, I'm not I, I don't have a product so I've got I'm not selling anything but I've done a lot of hypnotherapy for smoking and it's brilliant so if you happen to have uh, access to a hypnotherapist I would highly recommend it mm -hmm. um, but then you also have to look at do do you have 
um, type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance or hyperinsulinemia because those three things, which are really just variations of the same condition, are highly atherogenic. So, again, highly plaque forming is what atherogenic means. So we want to make sure that your not only is your glucose well controlled, but your insulin is well controlled. Now, again, if you're on a low-carb lifestyle, then hopefully it is. But we also know there are lots of people out there who want to be on a low-carb lifestyle but just can't quite nail it consistently. And so they end up falling into this situation where they're probably increasing their saturated or dietary fat and continuing to keep their carbs high. And that's probably the most dangerous situation, I think. Mm -hmm. So... um, so my formula, formula, if you like, my, my protocol is that I would always take a complete history, which, again, is why it's tricky. I know people like to have answers in Facebook forums and groups and things like that, but it really, it's quite, I love this word myopic, which just means kind of single-sighted or short-sighted. It's quite myopic to look at just a number and be able to make a decision for, on both ends, whether that's the GP saying your cholesterol is 8, you need a statin, or whether that's people on Facebook group going, hey, you don't need a statin, don't worry about it. You actually can't make the decision without the full picture of looking at smoking history, family history. Are they type 2 diabetic, insulin resistant or hyperinsulinemic? That would be my three things. And then I would do a calcium score to assess their background level of plaque and they're my favourite test. It's just called an LDL subfraction. So I love it. It's incredibly useful. It's a special test. It's not covered by Medicare, sadly, so it is about $200. But what it does is you get put through some fancy pants machine that tells you what sort of cholesterol you have. So do you have, remember there's seven types, do you have one and two, which are what we call big, fluffy, and they're not associated with cardiovascular disease or large buoyant if you're a bit posher than me? And then we go down to three, four, five, six, and seven, which are your small dents. And they are highly atherogenic and very, very much associated with, associated with cardiovascular disease. So, you know, if you've got a cholesterol of eight and they're all in that one and two, and you don't smoke and you don't have type two diabetes and your calcium score zero, then I am quite happy to just watch that and not do anything. Mm. But you can see it requires a little bit more yeah. of a conversation than just, a lot more to it than just looking at the blood test and going, oh, you need a statin or you don't need a statin. Correct. 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 <laughs> the thing to say is that it's also evolving. I mean, a lot of our knowledge on this is evolving all the time. Everything in medicine, if we're not constantly reevaluating and learning, then, you know, we're not doing a very good job. So the, you know, advice I gave 10 years ago, it's certainly not the advice I would give now. And the advice in 10 years' time, I don't know if it's going to be the same as this. This is the advice that I'm giving at the moment based on the knowledge that I have. Yeah. So with the HCL or the good one, (laughs) what benefit is, like, because I know that, like, you want that to be higher and there's often talk about a ratio between HDL and triglycerides. What's the benefit of that being higher? So HDL is the high-density lipoprotein. It's a completely different molecule to LDL. And what it does is it it removes cholesterol from your artery walls. So that's quite helpful because we really don't want, we want a little bit of cholesterol in each cell, but we don't want it packed up in artery walls. So HDL removes cholesterol from there and takes it back to the liver. Hooray. So that's good. But in reference to triglycerides, what what the the story there is, they themselves, the the numbers themselves are not particularly meaningful of anything other than the if you have a high HDL and a low triglyceride, that is likely to mean that your LDLs are big and fluffy. It's kind of weird, but that's kind of the summary of it. So high mm-hmm. HDL, low triglyceride, 
means LDL is more likely to be big and fluffy. But as I said, that's still a guesstimate because even today, that was when I saw the lady who has this beautiful ratio. She's got HDL of like 1.8 and a triglyceride of 0.4. Perfect. Mm. You think, oh, my God, you've got nothing to worry about. Except mm. that. So, and why does she have that? Again, we, we don't really know why she's got small dents. It's certainly not her glucose causing it. Hmm, interesting. Kelly yeah. has a good question. I'm just going to pop up on the screen. Um, oh, yeah. Is that LDL subfraction test something that you could ask your GP to do before starting medication or would you not need to find a specialist or a low-carb GP? Yeah, it's, um, Kelly, a lot of a lot of GPs probably don't know how to interpret it or specialists for that matter. Do they know um, how to order it? Yeah, you can order it's easy. Yeah, so all you do is literally you ask for an LDL subfraction. It's I send mine to the Adventist Hospital in Sydney, which is sadly run by the Seventh Day Adventists. The only thing they've ever done well. Not that I have any problem with their religion per se, but they own sanitarium, and I have a lot of problems with sanitarium. So keeping that out of it, um, the Adventist hospital in Sydney has the machine that can run the LDL subfractions. Nutripath is another organisation that does them as well and um, certain doctors and naturopaths can order them. You have to belong to Nutripath and I'm not convinced about the quality of their of some of their machines but I do like the Adventist one. So, yeah, so the GP can order it and then you get, it takes about three weeks to come back. They sort of batch them all. By the time it gets posted there, then they batch them and then they send the result. It's um, about three weeks and, as I said, it isn't covered at all by Medicare, so it's about $200, give or take. And where do you go to have the test? Just the pathology. Just normal pathology, yeah, yeah. And as long as they write LDL subfraction, the pathology collector should be able to do it. Some of them have never heard of the test and they have to look it up because it's not ordered very commonly, but they should be able to do it. And would a, a regular GP be able to interpret that test because it would give you the parameters or? No. No, because it still will give you, it gives you a range of LDL, even the LDL fluffies, so mm -hmm. one and two, it will still give you a very conservative range. Mm. And again, I don't, I don't actually care if mm. LDL one and two are above the, above this range, as yeah. long as it's none of the three, four, five, six, and seven. So yeah, it is, it is a little trickier. But again, I mean, there's lots of low carb um, GPs, obviously on low carb down under, um, or they can book telehealth with with somebody from either that page or obviously with us. So yeah, there's plenty of options. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'll do this one other question, and Erica's got some as well. Um, Mon has asked, does hypothyroidism affect your cholesterol? Yes. Yes. Severe. So a little bit, it's a little bit of hypothyroid. If you're profoundly hypo, profound hypothyroidism increases cholesterol. Yes. And correcting the thyroid problem should collect co correct the cholesterol collector cholesterol without um without needing any medications if the thyroid's been corrected and the cholesterol's still high then it wasn't because of the thyroid mm -hmm. in what way does it like how does it affect it what what's your ldl goes up okay yeah yeah cool okay we did have a couple of questions submitted um so Jules asks, would love to know your thoughts on Repartha, I don't know if I'm saying that right, injections and familiar hypocholesterolemia, are they necessary? Yeah. So familial hypercholesterolemia or FA. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> school, all we learn to do is pronounce very big words. and Very long words. You just break them down into chunks. <laughs> Yeah. So um, FH is a condition in which people have their liver makes too much cholesterol 
and it's associated with cardiovascular disease at a very young age. So they will have a family history of people having heart attacks in their early 40s, for example. The tricky thing at the moment is that, again, we have a lot of people in the low-carb world who, who do produce a lot of cholesterol but who aren't necessarily, don't necessarily have FH, i.e. they don't have any family history of cardiovascular disease. And this is where it becomes a little bit, we are sneaking into some uncharted territory because there are definitely some people within the low-carb community who are this, Dave Feldman has coined this term, lean mass hyper-responders. Um, and what that is often people who are quite thin or quite lean and um, often active and they their body produces, you know, lots of cholesterol. And I think most low-carb doctors are probably comfortable with cholesterols of 8 or 10, and, um, which, you know, again, GPs would, general yes. doctors would have a heart attack. Over that. <laughs> but there are some people out in the community who are getting cholesterols of 12, 15, mm -hmm. 18, like really high numbers and I think a lot of us are a bit uncomfortable about that maybe because we we don't know I'm so, sure yeah. so yeah. I was like well, we don't want to say it's not a problem how do we know yeah exactly yeah it's uncharted yeah. territories because there's no way anybody would let somebody kind of have a cholesterol like yeah. that and not have treated it in the past mm -hmm. so there is um there is a little bit of a trick of tricking there you can get for FH you can get a genetic test. There are genes. It's a genetic disorder. So most doctors, if they see somebody now with a cholesterol of 8 or 9, they will assume they've got FH, but they may not. They may just be a lean mass hyper responder. Mm -hmm. um, to tell it, the Repartha is a new uh, cholesterol medication that is done with injections. Um, you can do it with an infusion. I, I'm going to be honest and say I don't know a lot about it because I don't see a lot of people. It's it's often done through cardiology clinics and I don't see a lot of people requiring it. What happens with the our patient population is um, the, st the story goes, they, they fix up their diabetes and their cholesterol gets better. Hooray. So that's one lot. Yay. The second lot are the lean mass hyper responders. We do LDL subfractions and we're looking at lovely fluffies and we're very happy with that. Good, we don't buy, we don't treat that. The third lot are the people that have underlying cardiovascular disease. So they've already had a heart attack or they've got a lot of plaque in their arteries. And they're a completely different cattle of fish. So they're people who are doing what we call secondary prevention and I am very conservative with treating secondary prevention, i.e. I am way more likely to prescribe something like a statin or um, Lipodil, which is another um, medication that's used called um, Gemfibrozil as its fancy name. Um, and if I then needed something else, I'd use, I'd probably refer to cardiology for a, a bit more of an assessment. So I certainly wouldn't stop that, is my question there, without, without having more details. Yeah, right. Was there Fair another enough. question? There was another question. It wasn't cholesterol related. Um, so Sharon just asked, having a few cramps, headaches and sleeping problems, I'm taking magnesium and salt in my water trying to drink two litres a day. Any advice would help? Any thoughts? <laughs> how, how long have... Ha, ha, um... Have you been low carb would be my question. So is this just the transition period? We know there's a transition period, which is called, you know, keto flu, but it can mm. last up to two weeks. After that time, then, um, you know, headaches, headaches are much less of a problem for most people. Um, what were the other ones? Cramps? Mm-hmm. And... Tiredness was that? Sorry, were they the three sleep, sleeping problems? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure it was more sleepy or the, like can't sleep. Yeah, like that yeah, yeah. isn't clear when yeah. you just say yeah, sleep. It's not a sleep question. Sorry, darling. Um, <laughs> what I will say though is that there are there again. There's a little small subgroup of people who are low carb, particularly fasting people who are fasting and low carb who have trouble sleeping. So they're they're kind of like they're wired, um, and so they're. 
and again, if you look at some studies regarding circadian rhythm, for some people, having some carbohydrate, I know that feels like <gasps> I'm recommending the devil's food, but for some people having some carbohydrate in the evening, if they've got this particular sleeping problem, can be helpful for them. So again, I don't know whether she's having trouble going to sleep, falling asleep, staying asleep, or being awake, but um, yeah. Sure. A little more you elaborate on your question a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting you say that because I do remember when we've done extended fasting before and our ketones get quite high that yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I'm just like at bedtime like, what? <laughs> what <laughs> and, yeah. and for some people that doesn't bother them, but for a lot of people they do actually after a prolonged period of time, they get tired. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we love talking about sleep because there's so much goodness that happens while we're asleep with our bodies repairing and restoring and rejuvenating that we do need some sleep yeah um, and the other thing that some people get to with some fasting or um you know a deep ketosis is palpitations so again for some people having some extra calms it, it doesn't you know it's not it's not going to ruin their life it may make them feel a bit better yeah What's your thoughts around prescriptive, like, amounts of water to drink? You know how some people, like, I've got to drink three litres a day. Like, if I'm on a diet, then that means three litres a day. Or yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, uh, it's a little bit of rubbish. It's funny. So I'm going to navigate my way through it uh, because, like everything in my life, there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on the person but in the past we were given this whole thing if you have to drink eight glasses of water a day and it was largely um produced by diet industry because that would apparently stop you eating because you would fill your stomach up with water which is the biggest load of bollocks ever so that doesn't do anything but so ideally if you can drink to thirst that is the best but a lot of us don't listen to ourselves properly so a lot of people, and I'm one of these, I, I have a bit of thirst, I go, I'm too busy to drink, or I'm at work and I haven't got time to be running. Off or you just drink. forget, or, or like you're busy at work and you're like, I don't have time to go to the toilet. Well, so and you've got like a mask on and you know what I mean. Ah, like, yeah, I'm, 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 yeah. So, um, and the thing is that I do need to drink more because, if you, in particular, if you're if you're low carb and you're doing a lot of protein, you are at higher risk of kidney stones. So, <laughs> hands up, who's had a kidney stone? Oh, I have. They're horrid. And um, and it was it was entirely it was not about eating too much protein. It was about not drinking enough fluid. So I I don't think there's a right number as in how much should people drink. But I think if you can drink to your own thirst, then that's good. But, yeah, you don't have to be drinking, um, you know, like three litres a day. In fact, you can drink too much. You can definitely drink too much. And anything more than three is probably too much unless you're, you know, marathoning and then you should be having your electrolytes as well. We've had another question jump in. I'm just going to throw it on. Um, I had a CT coronary calcium, calcium score test which came back as zero. I'm 54. Is that normal? I've been doing keto for five years. Yes, it's good. High five. Yeah, high five. <laughs> yeah. Now, zero is the goal. If you can yeah. if you're zero, then basically that means that your risk of having a heart attack in the next 10 years is very low. It's not it zero. Does that mean you've got no plaque? It means you've got no calcified plaque. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. plaque, there is a thing called soft plaque. And then the, once the soft plaque's been hanging around for a while, it becomes calcified. So it doesn't exclude soft plaque. But if you've got no calcified plaque, you're not really going to have an artery chock full of soft plaque either. You're going to have maybe just a little bit. So, yeah, so that's why they give you the, um, yeah, so, yeah, Ali, it's good. It's, it's really good. Um, again, if you're um, under 50, we'd really hope that you do have, calcium score of about zero like really it shouldn't be that high, much higher and calcium score you know if you've got any calcium in your 40s then that's um that's not that's not doesn't bode well even a calcium score of like one or two or three if you're in your if you're 40 and you've got a calcium score of three then even though the number's really low and pathetic it doesn't 
you know, something needs to change because for the next 50 years, it's going to be more and more calcium. So we always take the age into consideration as well. Awesome. Well, this has been very informative. I've learnt lots, even though I've read lots about cholesterol. It was still in, I didn't know about the what the HDL's kind of role was, so that was interesting. Mm. I probably had one more question around it, and it comes up a bit. So, if someone starts a low carb diet, has blood work with their GP, their cholesterol has changed and increased, which we kind of mentioned before, would you suggest that they just wait? like wait and see what happens because the freak out is like there's a freak out that happens but one with the doctor and one with the patient <laughs> in the yeah. yeah um whereas like the low carb lifestyle has caused this but you just need yeah. to see like i think sometimes My you just need to see what happens also is if you are actively losing a lot of weight then that can be circulating and contributing to it is that Oh, totally. So this is the whole thing. So if you are becoming a fat burner, i.e. your primary source of fuel is fat, in particular your body fat, which is, you know, let's face it, that's what most of us want to be doing, burning our own body fat for fuel, then you will need to upregulate all of your lipoproteins, so your particularly your LDLs, because they transport it all around. So mm-hmm. suddenly there's more... You know, so triglyceride is our fuel. This is the thing. Triglyceride is our fuel and cholesterol is like our building block. So it's like the material. And they go together in the one unit. So if you're now, that's your lipoprotein. So if you're now requiring triglycerides to be moved all the way around from your toes up to, you know, your nose, then you need more LDL to do that. So, again, that's where the big fluffy comes in. It's not a big deal. It's only if that big fluffy molecule gets damaged, then that's what happens. It then goes and becomes a small dense. Mm -hmm. So big fluffy is fine. Small dense is not fine. It's damaged. And the the biggest cause of damage to turn a big fluffy into a small dense, there's two, Mm -hmm. smoking, (laughs) not sure if I mentioned that, Mm -hmm. and glucose. Mm -hmm. Glucose glycosylates it, causes oxidation, and that makes it shrink in. So, yeah, that's – so I have have written a blog. It's quite long. If anyone wants to go and have a look at it, they can um, find that on our website. Uh, it's a newish blog and it says something like, what about my cholesterol? Mm-hmm. Oh, there was one other here. I just missed it. I'll just chuck it back on. Um, does cholesterol go up during mm-hmm. menopause? Okay. Uh, not usually, not not because of menopause. So okay. no, menopause. Not unlike thyroid, menopause has no effect on the cholesterol per se. And I guess just going back to what you were saying about people, like initially their cholesterol going up when they're actively losing weight, like, and perhaps they need to wait and see what happens. I guess how long. Depends on how much weight they've lost, um, and which is a big a big component. Again, if you if you, if we're talking five kilos versus fifty kilos, um, it's a big difference in the amount of triglyceride that the body's going to be moving around. Um, yeah. So I, you know, again, I would always assuming that somebody is low carb for life and it's a lifestyle. Then you know, I, I tend not to do anything for twelve months. There's no rush. High cholesterol is not an emergency. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you want to see that it's a trend, like it's actually happening over yeah. a period of time, not just freak out on one. The right. other thing that comes up a bit, and this is Dave Feldman driven as well, is that mm. sometimes it's dependent on did you fast longer during before you had the test? And he, also, he says that that can change yeah, the results. And how many calories and the type of food you consume beforehand as well? Yeah. So there's variables that can happen that can mm. change the result. Mm. Yeah, totally. And Dave has a um, biohacking kind of protocol because the tricky thing is that things like insurance companies are still very much based on the old results of cholesterol. And so anything above, you know, 5.5, they're freaking out over. So if you rock in with a cholesterol of nine, you're not going to get insurance. This is for life or or you're going to have to pay a premium. 
So you, there, he does have a protocol, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can certainly go and look at his website, which may change your um, result. So cholesterol is quite dynamic. It will also go mm. up in illness. So, again, if you're sick, don't go and get your lipids done while you're unwell. Um, it will go up with inflammation. It's an um, acute phase reactant. So if you've got an underlying autoimmune disease like rheumatoid or lupus or something and you're having a flare-up, well, don't go and get your cholesterol done there. Get your cholesterol done when everything is perfect, when you're incredibly well, and don't fast. You're fasting really 12 to 14 hours max. Don't go in there with a 20-hour fast because you will have elevated triglycerides. That's normal. And, Dave, uh, and I haven't seen this, so this is probably just talking from him, and I can't quite work out the mechanism for it, but he thinks that if you drink truckloads of coffee, that will put up your triglycerides. So okay. it doesn't quite make sense to me, but anyway, I'm sure he's right. Um, so I would suggest, if again, if you're doing it for an insurance and you've got time on your side, then, then you know, just cut your coffee down for a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, yeah, I think we are. Thank you so much. It's been so. Oh, nice. thanks for having me on. Yeah, I liked having a topic as well. Yeah, it was, fun. It was interesting. Yeah. And yeah. we will definitely do this again. If anyone has particular topics that you would like Dr. Lucy to cover, please just shoot us an email or send us a message or whatever, and we will look at doing that next time um but yeah definitely check out the blog post on real life medicine about the cholesterol because it is very very in-depth <laughs> yeah, sorry it's a bit long i know i started doing it and then once i went down the rabbit hole i couldn't quite <laughs> get a, a, a low carb coffee <laughs> maybe a cup of having your cholesterol tested though <laughs> yes yeah, herbal tea if you're trying to cut down on your coffee have a little bit and uh Yes, we'll go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Lucy. You're welcome, Thanks, darling. Lucy. Okay, bye. 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 We also just wanted to mention before we go off is next week is Erica's birthday, the 18th. And so we're not going to do a live. We're having the night off. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I will be back with Dan versus the kitchen the week after, which is something like the 25th. We will see you guys then. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye. Bye.